section eleven of the countess of lowndes square and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis the countess of lowndes square and other stories by e f benson spook stories chapter four through richard waghorn was among the cleverest and most popular of professional mediums and a never-failing source of consolation to the credulous that there was fraud downright unadulterated fraud mixed up with his remarkable manifestations it would be impossible to deny but it would have been futile not to admit that these manifestations were not wholly fraudulent he had to an extraordinary degree that rare and inexplicable gift of tapping so to speak not only the surface consciousness of those who consulted him but in favourable circumstances their inner or subliminal selves so that it frequently happened that he could speak to an inquirer of something he had completely forgotten which subsequent investigation proved to be authentic so much was perfectly genuine but he gave as it were a false frame to it all by the manner in which he presented these phenomena he pretended at his seances to go into a trance during which he was controlled sometimes by the spirit of an ancient egyptian priest who gave news to the inquirer about some dead friend or relative sometimes more directly by that dead friend or relative who spoke through him as a matter of fact waghorn would not be in a trance at all but perfectly conscious extracting as he sat quiescent and with closed eyes the knowledge remembered or even forgotten that lurked in the mind of his sitter and bringing it out in the speech of mentu the egyptian control or of the lost friend or relative about whom inquiry was being made fraudulent also as purporting to come from the intelligence of discarnate spirits were the pieces of information he gave as to the conditions under which those who had passed over still lived and it was here that he chiefly brought consolation to the credulous for he represented the dead as happy and busy and full of spiritual activities this information to speak frankly he obtained entirely from his own conscious mind he made it up and we cannot really find an excuse for him in the undoubted fact that he sincerely believed in the general truth of all he said when he spoke of the survival of individual personality finally deeply dyed with fraud and that in crude garish colours were the spirit wrappings the playing of musical boxes the appearance of materialized spirits the smell of incense that heralded cardinal newman all that bag of conjuring tricks in fact which disgraces and makes a laughing stock of the impostors who profess to be able to bring the seen world into connection with the unseen world but to do waghorn justice he did not often employ those crude contrivances for his telepathic and thought-reading gifts were far more convincing to his sitters occasionally however his powers in this line used to fail him and then it must be confessed he presented his egyptian control with every trapping and circumstance of degrading device such was the general scheme of procedure when richard waghorn with his sister as accomplice in case mechanical tricks were necessary undertook to reveal the spirit world to the material world they were a pleasant handsome pair of young people gifted with a manner that if anything disarmed suspicion too much and while feudal old gentlemen found it quite agreeable to sit in the dark holding julia's firm cool hand similarly constituted old ladies were the recipients of thrilling emotions when they held richard's 
the touch of which they declared was strangely electric there they sat while richard breathing deeply and moaning in his simulated trance was the mouthpiece of mentu and told them things which but for his indubitable gift of thought reading it was impossible for him to know or if the power was not coming through properly they listened hardly less thrilled to spirit rappings and musical boxes and unverifiable information about the conditions of life where the mortal coil hampers no longer it was all very interesting and soothing and edifying and then one day there occurred an eruption of something wholly unexpected and inexplicable brother and sister were dining quietly after a busy but unsatisfactory day when the tinkling summons came from the telephone and richard found that a loud voice belonging so it said to mrs gardiner wanted to arrange a sitting alone for next day no address was given but he made an appointment for half-past two and without much enthusiasm went back to his dinner a stranger he said to his sister with no address and no reference or introduction i hope i shall be in better form to-morrow there was nothing but rappings and music to-day they are boring and also they are dangerous for one may be detected at any time and i got an infernal blow on my knuckles from that new electric tapper julia laughed i know i heard it she said there was quite wrong noise in one of the taps as we were spelling out silver wing he lit his cigarette frowning at the smoke that's the worst of my profession he said on some days i can get quite right inside the mind of the sitter and as you know bring out the most surprising information but on other days to-day for instance and there have been many such lately there's a mere blank wall in front of me i shall lose my position if it happens often nobody will pay my fees only to hear spirit rappings and generalities they're better than nothing said julia very little they help to fill up but i hate using them don't you remember when we began investigating just you and i alone how often we seemed on the verge of genuine supernatural manifestations they appeared to be just round the corner yes but we never turned the corner we never got beyond mere thought reading he got up i know we didn't but there always seemed a possibility the door was ajar it wasn't locked and it has never ceased to be ajar often when the mere thought reading as you call it is flowing along most smoothly i feel that if only i could abandon my whole consciousness a little more completely something somebody would really take control of me i wish it would and yet i'm frightened of it it might revenge itself for all the frauds i've perpetrated in its name come let's play piquet and forget about it all it was settled that julia should be present next day when the stranger came for her sitting in order that if richard's thought reading was not coming through any better than it had done lately she should help in the wrappings and the luminous patches and the musical box mrs gardiner was punctual to her appointment tall quiet well-dressed woman who stated with the perfect frankness her object in wishing for a seance and her views about spirit communication i should immensely like to believe in spirit communication she said such as i am told you are capable of producing but at present i don't it is important that the atmosphere should not be one of hostility said waghorn in his dreamy professional manner i bring no hostility she said i am in a state shall we say of benevolent neutrality unless and she smiled in a charming manner unless benevolent neutrality has come to mean malevolent hostility that i assure you is not the case with me i want to believe she paused a moment and may i say this without offence she asked 
may i tell you that spirit rappings and curious lights and sounds of music do not interest me in the least they were already seated in the room where the seance was to be held the windows were thickly curtained there was only a glimmer of light from the red lamp and even this the spirits would very likely desire to have extinguished if this visitor took no interest in such things waghorn felt that he and his sister had wasted their time in adjusting the electric hammer made to rap by the pressure of the foot on a switch concealed in the thick rug underneath the table behind the sliding panel in stringing across the ceiling the invisible wires on which the luminous globes ran and in making ready all the auxiliary paraphernalia in case the genuine telepathy was not on tap so with voice dreamier than before and with slower utterance as he was supposed to be beginning to sink into trance he just said i can't foretell the manner in which they may choose to make their presence known he gave one loud rap which perfectly conveyed the word no to his sister indicating that the conjuring tricks were not to be used subsequently if really necessary he could rap yes to her and the music and the magic lights would be displayed then he began to breathe quickly and in a snorting manner to show that the control was taking possession of him my brother is going into trance very quickly said julia and there was dead silence almost immediately a clear and shining lucidity spread like sunshine after these days of cloud over waghorn's brain every moment he found himself knowing more and more about this complete stranger who sat with hand touching his he felt his subconscious brain which had lately lain befogged and imperceptive sun itself under the brilliant clarity of illumination that had come to it and in the impressive bass in which mentu was wont to give vent to his revelations he said i am here mentu is here he felt the table rocking beneath his hands which surprised him since he had exerted no pressure on it and he supposed that julia had not understood his signal and was beginning the conjuring tricks one hand of his was in hers and by the pressure of his fingertips he conveyed to her in code don't do it instantly she answered back i wasn't he paid no more heed to that though the table continued to oscillate and tip in a very curious manner for his mind was steeped in this flood of images that impressed themselves on his brain what shall mentu tell you to-day he went on with pauses between the sentences someone has come to consult mentu it is a lady i can see her she wears a locket round her neck below her coat with a piece of black hair and a glass between the gold he felt a slight jerk from mrs gardner's hand and in fingertip code said to julia ask her julia whispered across the table is that so yes said mrs gardner and waghorn heard her take her breath quickly he just remembered that she was not in mourning but that made no difference he knew not guessing that mrs gardner wished to know something from the man or woman on whose head that hair once grew which was contained in the locket that rested unseen below her buttoned jacket then the next moment he knew also that this was a man's hair thereafter the flood of sun and precise mental impressions poured over him in spate of bright waters she wants to know about the boy whose hair is in the locket he is not a boy now he is according to earth's eyes a grown man there is a d i see a d not dick not david there is a y it is dennis not saint dennis not french english dennis dennis bristow he paused a moment and heard mrs gardner whisper yes that is right 
waghorn gave vent to mentu's jovial laugh she says it is right he said how should not mentu be right perhaps mentu is right too when he says that dennis is her brother yes that is margaret bristow who sits here though not margaret bristow now margaret waghorn saw the name quite clearly but yet he hesitated it was not gardner at all then it struck him for the first time that nothing was more likely than that mrs gardner had adopted a pseudonym he went on margaret forsyth is dennis's sister margaret wants to know about dennis dennis is coming he will be here in a moment he has spoken of his sister before he did not call her margaret he called her q he called her queenie will queenie speak waghorn felt the trembling of her hand he heard her twice try to speak but she was unable to control the trembling in her voice can dennis speak to me she said in a whisper can he really come here up to this moment waghorn had been enjoying himself immensely for after the days in which he had been unable to get into touch with this rare and marvellous gifts of consciousness reading it was blissful to find his mastery again and besieged with the images which margaret forsyth's contact revealed to him he had been producing them in mentu's impressive voice revelling in his restored powers her mind lay open to him like a book he could read where he liked on pages familiar to her and on pages which had remained long unturned but at this moment as sudden as some qualm of sickness he was aware of a startling change in the quality of his perceptions fresh knowledge of dennis bristow came into his mind but he felt that it was not coming from her but from some other source some odd buzzing sang in his ears as when an anaesthetic begins to take effect and opening his eyes he thought he saw a strange patch of light inconsistent with the faint illumination of the red lamp hovering over his breast at the same moment he heard though dimly for his head was full of confused noise the violent rapping of the electric hammer and already only half conscious felt an impotent irritation with his sister for employing these tricks he struggled with the oncoming of the paralysis that was swiftly invading his mind and his physical being but he struggled in vain and next moment overwhelmed with the onrush of a huge enveloping blackness he lost consciousness altogether the trance that he had often simulated had invaded him and he knew nothing more he came to himself again with the feeling that he had been recalled from some vast distance still unable to move he sat listening to the quick panting of his own breath before he realized what the noise was his face from which the sweat poured in streams rested on something cold and hard and presently when he opened his eyes he saw that his head had fallen forward upon the table he felt utterly exhausted and yet somehow strangely satisfied some amazing thing had happened then as he recovered himself he began to remember that he had been reading mrs gardner's or mrs forsyth's mind when some power external to himself took possession of him and on his left he heard julia's voice speaking very familiar words he's coming out of his trance she said he will be himself again in a moment now with a sense of great weariness he raised his head disengaged his hands from those of the two women and sank back in his chair draw back the curtains he said to julia and open the window i'm suffocating she did as he told her and he saw the red rays of the sun near to its setting pour into the room while the breeze of sunset refreshed the air on his right still sat mrs forsyth wiping her eyes and smiling at him and having opened the window julia came back to the table looking at him with a curious anxious intentness 
then mrs forsyth spoke it has been too marvellous she said i cannot thank you enough i will do exactly as you or rather dennis told me about the test and if it is right i will certainly leave my house to-morrow taking my servants with me it was so like dennis to think of them too to waghorn this meant nothing whatever she might have been speaking hebrew to him but julia as she often did answered for him my brother knows nothing of what happened in his trance she said mrs forsyth got up i will go straight home she said i feel sure that i shall find just what dennis described may i telephone to you about it at once yes pray do said julia we shall be most anxious to hear richard got up to show her out but having regained his feet he staggered and collapsed into his chair again mrs forsyth would not hear of his attempting to move just yet and julia having taken her to the door returned to her brother it was usual for him when the sitting was over to feign great exhaustion but the realism of his acting to-day had almost deceived her into thinking that something not yet experienced in their seances had occurred besides he had said such strange detailed and extraordinary things he was still where she had left him and there could be no reason now that they were alone to keep up this feigned languor dick she said what's the matter and what happened i couldn't understand you at all why did you say all those things he stirred and sat up i'm better he said and it is you who have to tell me what happened i remember up to a certain point and after that i lost consciousness completely i remember thinking you were rocking the table and i told you not to yes but i wasn't rocking it i thought you were well it was neither of us then said he i was vexed because mrs gardner mrs forsyth had said she didn't want that sort of thing and i was reading her as i never read any one before i told her about the locket and the black hair i got her brother's name i got her name and her nickname queenie then she asked if dennis could really come and at that moment something began to take possession of me i think i saw a light as usual over my breast and i think i heard a tremendous rapping did you do either of those or did they really happen julia stared at him for a moment in silence i did neither of those she said but they happened you must have pressed the breast pocket switch and trod on the switch of the hammer he opened his coat i had not got the breast pocket switch he said and i certainly did not tread on the hammer switch julia moved her chair a little closer to him the hammer did not sound right she said it was ten times louder than i have ever heard and the light was quite different somehow it was much brighter i could see everything in the room quite distinctly go on dick i can't that's all i know until i came to leaning over the table and bathed in perspiration tell me what happened dick do you swear that it's true she asked certainly i do go on the light grew and then faded again to a glimmer she said and then suddenly you began to talk in a different voice it wasn't meant to any longer mrs forsyth recognized it instantly and i thought what wonderful luck it was that you should have hit on a voice that was like your brother's then it and she had a long talk it must have lasted half an hour they reminded each other how dennis had come to live with her and her husband on their father's death he was only eighteen at the time and still at school he was killed in a street accident being run over by a bicycle two days before her birthday all this was correct and i thought i never heard you mind reading so clearly and quickly you hardly paused at all julia was silent a moment dick don't you really know what followed she asked not in the smallest degree he said well i thought you had gone mad she said 
mrs forsyth asked for a test something that was not known to her and had never been known to her and you gave it instantly you laughed dennis laughed the voice that spoke laughed and told her to look behind the row of books beside the bed in the room that was still known as dennis's room and she would find tucked away a little cardboard box with a gold safety pin set with a pearl he had bought it for her birthday present and had hidden it there till the day came he was killed as i told you two days before and she half sobbing half laughing said oh dennis how deliciously secretive you used to be and is that what she's going to telephone about asked waghorn yes dick what made you say all that i didn't know i tell you i didn't know i said it and was that all she said something about leaving her house tomorrow and taking the servants what did that mean you got very much distressed you told her she was in danger you said julia paused again you said there was something coming fire from the clouds and a rending you said her country house which i gathered was down somewhere near epping would be burst open by the fire from the clouds to-morrow night you made her promise to leave it and take the servants with her you said her husband was away which again is the case and she asked if you meant zeppelins and you said you did waghorn suddenly got up you meant you said you did he cried what if it's he meant he said he did it's impossible she said good lord what's impossible he asked what if i really am that which i have so long pretended to be what if i am a medium one who is the mysterious bridge between the quick and the dead i'm frightened but i'm bound to say i'm horribly interested all that you tell me i said when i was in a trance never came out of mrs forsyth's mind it wasn't there she didn't know about the pearl pin she had never known it nor had i ever known it where did it come from then only one person knew the boy who died ten years ago it yet remains to be seen whether it is true said she we shall know in an hour or two for she is motoring straight down to her house in the country and if it turns out to be true who was talking said he the sunset faded into the dusk of the clear may evening and the two still sat there waiting for the telephone to inform them whether the door which as waghorn had said had seemed so often ajar and never quite closed was now thrown open and light and intelligence from another world had shone on his unconscious mind presently the tinkling summons came and with an eager curiosity below which lurked that fear of the unknown the dim mysterious land into which all human creatures pass across the closed frontier he went to hear what news awaited him trunk call said the operator and he listened soon the voice came through mr waghorn it said yes i have found the box and exactly the place described it contained what we had been told it would contain i shall leave the house taking all the servants away to-morrow two mornings later the papers contained news of a zeppelin raid during the night on certain eastern counties the details given were vague and meagre and no names of towns or villages where bombs had been dropped were vouchsafed to the public but later in the day private information came to waghorn that forsyth hall near epping had been completely wrecked no lives luckily were lost for the house was empty End of section 11section 12 of the countess of lowne square and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devora allen the countess of lowne square and other stories by e f benson cat stories 
Chapter One, Puscat. It was during the month of May, some nine years ago, that the beginning of the events that concerned Puscat took place. I was living at the time on the green outskirts of a country town, and my dining room at the back of the house opened on to a small garden framed in brick walls some five feet high. Breakfasting there one morning, I saw a large black and white cat with a sharp but serious face observing me with studied attention. Now at the time there was an interregnum, and my house was without a mistress, in the shape of a cat, and it at once struck me that I was being interviewed by this big and pleasing stranger to see if I would do. So, since there is nothing that a prospective mistress likes less than premature familiarity on the part of the householder whom she may be thinking of engaging, I took no direct notice of the cat, but continued to eat my breakfast carefully and tidily. After a short inspection, the cat quietly withdrew without once looking back, and I supposed that I was dismissed, or that she had decided, after all, to keep on her present household. In that I proved to be mistaken. She had only gone away to think about it, and next morning, and for several mornings after that, I was subjected to the same embarrassing but not unfriendly scrutiny, after which she took a stroll round the garden to see if there were any flower-beds that would do to make ambushes in, and a convenient tree or two to climb should emergencies arise. On the fourth day, as far as I remember, I committed an error, and halfway through breakfast went out into the garden, to attempt to get on more familiar terms. The cat regarded me for a few moments with pained surprise, and went away. But after I had gone in again, she decided to overlook it, for she returned to her former place and continued to observe. Next morning she made up her mind, jumped down from the wall, trotted across the grass, entered the dining-room, and, arranging herself in a great hurry round one hind leg, which she put up in the air like a flagstaff, proceeded to make her morning toilette. That, as I knew quite well, meant that she thought I would give satisfaction, and I was therefore permitted to enter upon my duties at once. So I put down a saucer of milk for her, which she very obligingly disposed of. Then she went and sat by the door and said, Ah! to show that she wished the door to be opened for her, so that she might inspect the rest of the house. So I called down the kitchen stairs, There has come a cat, who I think means to stop. Don't fuss her. In this manner the real puss-cat, though I did not know that, entered the house. Now here I must make a short defense for my share in these things. I might, by a hasty judgment, be considered to have stolen her who soon became puss-cat's mamma. But anyone who has a real knowledge of cats will be aware that I did nothing of the kind. Puss-cat's mamma was clearly dissatisfied with her last household, and had, without the least doubt, made up her mind to leave them all and take on a fresh lot of servants. And if a cat makes up her mind about anything, no power on earth except death, or permanent confinement in a room where neither doors nor windows are ever opened, will stop her taking the contemplated step. If her last, unknown household, killed her, or permanently shut her up, of course, she could not engage fresh people, but short of that they were powerless to keep her. You may cajole or bully a dog into doing what you want, but no manner of persuasion will cause a cat to deviate one hair's breadth from the course she means to pursue. If I had driven her away, she would have gone to another house, but never back to her own. For though we may own dogs and horses and other animals, it is a great mistake to think that we own cats. Cats employ us, and if we give satisfaction they may go so far as to adopt us. Besides, Puss Cat's mamma did not, as it turned out, mean to stay with me altogether. She only wanted quiet lodgings for a time. So our new mistress went discreetly downstairs and inspected kitchen, scullery, and pantry. She spent some time in the scullery, so I was told, and felt rather doubtful. But she quite liked the new gas stove in the kitchen, and singed her tail at it, as nobody had told her that lunch was a-cooking. Also she found a mouse-hole below the wainscoting, which appeared to decide her, for, as we soon found out, she liked work. And she trotted upstairs again, and sat outside the drawing-room door till somebody opened it for her. I happened to be inside, with Jill, a young lady of the fox-terrier breed, and, of course, did not know that Puss-Cat's mamma was waiting. Eventually I came out and saw her sitting there. Jill saw her, too, and eagerly ran up to her, only to talk, not to fight, for Jill likes cats. But Puss-Cat's mamma did not know that, so just in case, she slapped Jill smartly first on one side of the head and then on the other. She was not angry, but only firm and strong and wished that from the first there should be no doubt whatever about her position. Having done that, she allowed Jill to explain, 
which Jill did with twitchings of her stumpy tail and attitude provocative of gambles. And before many minutes were up, Puss-Cat's mamma was kind enough to play with her. Then she suddenly remembered that she had not seen the rest of the house, and went upstairs, where she remained till lunchtime. It was the manner in which she spent the first morning that gave me the key to the character of Puss-Cat's mamma, and we at once settled that her name had always been Martha. She had annexed our house, it is true, but in no grabbing or belligerent spirit, but simply because she had seen from her post on the garden wall that we wanted somebody to look after us and manage the house, and she could not help knowing how wonderful she was in all things connected with the mistress's duties. Every morning when the housemaid's step was heard on the stairs during breakfast, she had a very audible step, Martha, even in the middle of fish or milk, ran to the door, said, Ah! till it was opened, and rushed after her, sitting in each bedroom in turn to see that the slops were properly emptied and the beds well and truly made. In the middle of such supervision, sometimes came other calls upon her. The front doorbell would ring, and Martha had to hurry down to see that the door was nicely opened. Then perhaps she would catch sight of somebody digging in the garden, and she was forced to go out in this busiest time of the morning to dab at the turned-up earth in order to be sure that it was fresh. In particular, I remember the day on which the dining-room was repapered, she had to climb the step-ladder to ascertain if it was safe, and sit on the top to clean herself. Then each roll of paper had to be judged by the smell, and the paste to be touched with the end of a pink tongue. That made her sneeze, which must be the right test for paste, and she allowed it to be used. That day we lunched in the drawing-room, and it is easy to imagine how busy Martha was, for the proceeding was very irregular, and she could not tell how it would turn out. Meal-times were always busy, she had to walk in front of every dish as it was brought in, and proceed it as it was taken out. And today these duties were complicated by the necessity of going back constantly to the real dining-room to see that the paper-hangers were not idling. To make the rush more overpowering, Jill was in the garden wanting to play, and to play with Jill was one of Martha's duties. And some young hollyhocks were being put in, certain of which, for inscrutable reasons, had to be dug up again with strong backward kicks of the hind legs. She had settled that there was but one cat, which was, of course, herself. Occasionally alien heads looked over the wall, and the cries of strangers sounded. Whenever that happened, whatever the stress of housework might be, Martha bounded from house into garden to expel and, if possible, kill the intruder. Once from my bedroom window I saw a terrific affair. Martha had been sitting as good as gold among hairbrushes and nail scissors, showing me how to shave, when something feline moving in the garden caught her eye. Not waiting for the door to be opened, she made one leap of it out of the window into the apple tree and whirled down the trunk, even as lightning strikes and rips its way to the ground. And next moment I saw her with paw uplifted, tearing tufts of fur from the next door tabby. She was like one of those amazing Chinese grotesques, half cat, half demon, and holy warrior. Shrill cries rent the peaceful morning air, and Martha, intoxicated with vengeance, allowed the mishandled tabby to escape. Then, with awesome face and bacchanalian eye, she ate the tufts of blood-stained fur, rolling them on her tongue and swallowing them with obvious difficulty, as if performing some terrible, antique, and cannibalistic rite. And all this from a lady who was so shortly to be confined. But it was no use trying to keep Martha quiet. A second minute inspection of her house was necessary before she decided which should be the birth-chamber. She spent a long time in the woodshed that morning, and we hoped that it was going to be there. She spent a long time in the bathroom, and we hoped it wasn't. Eventually she settled on the pantry, and when she had quite made up her mind we made her comfortable. Next morning three dappled little blind things were there. She ate one, for no reason as far as we could judge, but that she was afraid that Jill wanted to. So, as it was her kitten, not Jill's, she ate it. With all respect for Martha, I think that here she had mistaken her vocation, she should never have gone in for being a mother. The second kitten she lay down upon with fatal results. Then, being thoroughly disgusted with maternity, she went away and never was seen any more. She deserted the only child she had not killed. She deserted us, who had tried so hard to give satisfaction. And in the basket there was left, still blind, still uncertain whether it was worth while to live at all, Puscat. Puscat was her mother's own child from the first, though with much added. She wasted no time or strength in bewailing her orphaned condition, but took amazing quantities of milk administered on a feather. 
Her eyes opened, as eyes should do, on the seventh day, and she smiled at us all and spat at Jill. So Jill licked her nose with anxious care and said quite distinctly, When you are a little older, I will be always ready to do whatever you like. Jill says the same sort of thing to everybody except the dustman. Soon after, Puscat arose from her birth bed and staggered across the pantry. Even this first expedition on her own feet was not made without purpose, for in spite of frequent falls, she went straight up to a blind tassel, and after looking at it for a long time, tested it with a tiny paw to make sure of it, thus showing, while scarcely out of the cradle, that serious purpose which marked her throughout her dear life. Her motto was, Do your work, and since she remained unmarried in spite of very many eligible offers, I think that her unnatural mother must have impressed upon her, in those few days before she deserted her, that the first duty of a cat is to look after the house, and that she herself didn't think much of maternity. Puscat inherited also, I suppose, her fixed conviction that she ought to have been, even if she was not, the only cat in the world, and she would allow no one of her own race within eyeshot of house or garden. Some of her duties, though they were always conscientiously performed, I think rather bored her, but certainly she brought to the expulsion of cats an exquisite sense of enjoyment. On the appearance of any one of her own nation, she would go hastily into ambush with twitching tail and jerking shoulder blades, teasing and torturing herself with the postponement of that rapturous, stealthy advance across the grass, if the quarry was looking the other way, or the furious hurling of herself through the air if a frontal attack had to be delivered. And I often wondered that she did not betray her ambush by the rapture and sonorousness of her purring, as the supreme moment approached. Jill, I am afraid, gave her a lot of worry over this duty of the expulsion of aliens, for Jill would sooner play with an alien than expel it, and her plan was to gamble up to the intruder with misplaced welcome. It is true that the effect was just the same, because a trespassing cat, seeing an alert fox terrier rapidly approaching, seldom, if ever, stops to play, so that Jill's method was really quite effective, too. But Puss Cat had high moral purpose behind her. She wanted not only to expel, but to appall and injure, and like many moralists of our own species, she enjoyed her fulminations and onslaughts quite tremendously. She liked punishing other cats because she was right and they were wrong, and vigorous kicks and bites would help them perhaps to understand that. But though Puss Cat resembled her mother in the matter of the high sense of duty and moral qualities, she had what Martha lacked, that indefinable attraction which we call charm, and a great heart. She was always pleased and affectionate, and went about her duties with as near an approach to a smile as is possible for the gravest species of animal. Martha, for instance, played with Jill as a part of her duty. Puss Cat made a pleasure out of it, and played with the ecstatic abandon of a child. Indeed, I have known her put dinner a quarter of an hour later, because she was in the lovely jungle of long grass at the end of the garden, and was preparing to give Jill an awful fright. This business of the jungle deserves mention, not because it was so remarkable in itself, but because it was so wonderful to Puscat. The jungle in question was a space of some dozen yards, where in spring daffodils grew in clumps of sunshine, and fritillaries hung their speckled bells. There were peonies also planted in the grass, and a briar rose and an apple tree. Nothing, as I have said, was remarkable in itself, but it was fraught with amazing possibilities to the keen imagination of Puscat. At the bottom of this strip of untamed jungle the lawn began, and it was one of Puss Cat's plans to hide at the edge of the jungle, flattening herself out till she looked like a shadow of something else. If luck served her, Jill, sooner or later, in the pursuit of interesting smells, would pass close to the edge of the jungle without seeing her. The moment Jill had gone by, Puss Cat would stretch out a discreet paw and just touch Jill on the hindquarters. Jill, of course, had to turn round to see what this inexplicable thing meant, and on the moment... Puss Cat would fling herself into the air and descend tiger-like on Jill's back. That was the beginning of the game, and it contained more vicissitudes than a round of golf. There were ambushes and scurryings innumerable, assaults from the apple tree, repulsions from behind the garden roller, periods of absolute quiescence, suddenly and wildly broken by swift flanking movements through the sweet peas, and at the end a failure of wind and limb, and Jill would lie panting on the bank, and Puss Cat, having put off dinner, proceeded to clean herself for her evening duties. She had to be smart at dinner-time, whether we were dining alone or whether there was a dinner-party, for she was never a tea-gown cat, and she dressed for her dinner, even if we were dining out. She was not responsible for that. 
what she was responsible for was to be tidy herself. Puss-cat, without doubt, was a plain kitten, but again, like many children of our own inferior race, she grew up to be a very handsome cat. With great chic, she did not attempt colors, but was pure black and white. Across her broad, strong back there was a black saddle, but the saddle, so to speak, had slewed round and made a black band across her left side. There was an arbitrary patch of black, too, on her left cheek, a black band on her tail, and a black tip to it. Otherwise she was pure white, except when she put out a pink tongue below her long, snowy whiskers. But her charm, the outstanding feature of Puss-Cat, was independent of this fascinating coloring. Martha, for instance, had been content that dishes were carried into the dining-room and subsequently carried out. That and no more was her notion of her duties towards dinner. But Puss-Cat really began where Martha ended. Like her, she preceded the soup, but when those who were present had received their share, she always went round with loud purrings to each guest, to congratulate them and hope that they liked it. For this process, which was repeated with every dish, she had a particular walk, stepping high and treading on the tips of her toes. This congratulatory march was purely altruistic. She did not want soup herself. She was only glad that other people had got it. Then, when fish came, or bird, she would make her congratulatory tour just the same, and then sit firmly down and say she would like some too. Occasionally she favoured some particular guest with marked regard, and sometimes almost forgot her duties as mistress of the house, choosing rather to sit by her protégé and purr loudly, so that a dish would already be half-eaten before she went her round to see that everyone was pleased with his portion. Finally, when coffee was brought, she went downstairs to the kitchen and retired for the night, usually sharing Jill's basket, where they lay together in a soft, slow-breathing heap of black and white. Puss-cat, like the ancient Greeks, was never sick or sorry. Never sick, because of her robust and stalwart health. Never sorry, because she never did anything to be sorry for. From living with Jill, and never seeing a cat, except for those short and painful interviews which preceded expulsion from the garden, she grew to have something of the selfless affection of a dog. And when I came home after an absence, she would run out into the street to meet me, stiff-tailed, and really not attending to the debarkation of luggage, but intent only on welcoming me home. Eight busy, happy years passed thus, and then one bitter February morning, Pussycat disappeared. The weeks went on, and still there came no sign of her, and when winter had passed into May, I gave up all hopes of her return, and got a fresh cat, this time a young blue Persian with topaz-colored eyes. Another month went by, and Agag, so called from his delicate walk, had established himself in our affections on account of his extraordinary beauty, rather than from any charm of character, when the second act of the tragedy opened. I was sitting at breakfast one morning, with the door into the garden thrown wide, and Agag was curled up on a chair in the window, for unlike Puss-Cat and Martha, he did no housework at all, being of proud and aristocratic descent. When I saw coming slowly across the lawn a cat that I scarcely recognized, it was lean to the point of emaciation. Its fur was disordered and dirty, but it was Puss-Cat come home again. Then suddenly she saw me, and with a little cry of joy ran towards the open door. Then she saw Agag, and weak and thin as she was, she woke at once to her old sense of duty and bounded on to his chair. Never before in her time had a cat got right into the house, and such a thing she felt determined should not occur again. Round the room and out into the garden raged the battle before I could separate them, Puss-Cat inspired by her sense of duty, Agag angry and astonished at this assault of a mere gutter-cat in his own house. At last I got hold of Puss-Cat and took her up in my arms, while Agag cursed and swore in justifiable indignation. For how could he tell that this was Puss-Cat? They never fought again, but it was a miserable fortnight that followed, and all the misery was poor Puss-Cat's. Agag, in spite of his beauty, had no heart, and did not mind how many cats I kept, so long as they did not molest him, or usurp his food or his cushion. But Puss-Cat, though she understood that for some inscrutable reason she had to share her house with Agag and not fight him, was a creature of strong affections, and her poor little soul was torn with agonies of jealousy. Jill, it is true, who was always treated with contemptuous unconsciousness by Agag, was certainly pleased to see her friend again, and had not forgotten her. But Puss-Cat wanted so much more than Jill could give her. 
she took on her old duties at once, but often when she escorted the fish into the dining room and found Agag asleep on his chair, she would be literally unable to go through with them and would sit in a corner by herself, looking miserably and uncomprehendingly at me. Then perhaps the smell of fish would wake up Agag, and he would stretch himself and stand for a moment with superbly arched back on his chair, before he jumped down, and with loud purrings rubbed himself against the legs of my chair to betoken his desire for food, or even would jump up onto my knees. That was the worst of all for Puscat, and she would often sit all dinner through in her remote corner, refusing food, and unable to take her eyes off the object of her jealousy. While Agag was present, no amount of caresses or attentions offered to her would console her, so that, when Agag had eaten, we usually turned him out of the room. Then for a little while Puscat had respite from her Promethean vulture. She would go her rounds again to see that everybody was pleased, and escort fresh dishes in with high-stepping walk and erect tail. We hoped, foolishly perhaps, that in course of time the two would become friends, else I think I should have at once tried to find another home for Agag. But indeed, short of that, we did all we could do, lavishing attentions on dear Puscat, and trying to make her feel, which indeed was true, that we all loved her, and only liked and admired Agag. But while we still hoped, Puscat had had more than she could bear, and once again she disappeared. Jill missed her for a little while, Agag not at all. But the rest of us miss her still. End of section 12section 13 of the countess of lounge square and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devora allen the countess of lounge square and other stories by e f benson cat stories chapter 2 there arose a king Agag, though of undoubtedly royal blood, was never a real king. He was no more than one of the Hiskos, a shepherd king, bound by the limitations of his race, and no partaker in its magnificence. Naturally, he did not work, as the late housekeeper had done, and no one expected that of him. But he had neither the splendor nor the vivacity possessed, let us say, by Henry the Eighth or George the Fourth to make up for his indolence in affairs of state. Henry the Eighth, anyhow, busied himself in marriages, whereas Agag was merely terrified at the idea of wooing, not to say winning, any of the princesses that were brought to his notice, and they, on their part, only made the rudest faces at him. Again, George the Fourth, though unkingly in many respects, used to plunge about in the wild pursuit of pleasure, and was supposed to have a kind heart. Agag, on the contrary, never plunged. A cushion and some fish and plenty of repose were the sum of his desires, and as for a kind heart, he never had a heart at all. An unkind heart would have given him some semblance of personality, but there was not the faintest room to suppose that any emotion, other than the desire for food and sleep and warmth, came within measurable distance of him. He died in his sleep, probably of apoplexy, after a large meal, and beautiful in death as in life, was buried and forgotten. I have never known a cat so completely devoid of character and I sometimes wonder whether he was a real cat at all, and not some sort of inflated dormouse in cat's clothing. There followed a republican regime in this matter of cats. We went back, after Agag, to working cats, who would sit at mouse holes for hours together, pounce and devour, and clean themselves and sleep. But among them all there was no character which ever so faintly resembled even Martha, far less Puscat. I suppose the royalty of Agag, stupid and dull though he was, had infected me with a certain snobbishness as regards cats, and secretly, given that there were to be no more of those splendid plebeians like Puscat, I longed for somebody who combined royal descent, for the sake of beauty and pride, with character, good or bad. Nero, or Heliogabalus, or Queen Elizabeth, or even the Emperor William the Second of Germany would have done, but I didn't want George the First on the one side, or a mere mild president of a small republic on the other. Just after Agag's death, I had moved up to London, and for a time there was this succession of unnoticeable heads of the state. They were born, those presidents of my republic, from respectable, hard-working families, and never gave themselves out, though they knew quite well that they were the heads of the state, to be anything else but what they were. 
good, hard-working cats, with, of course, not only a casting, but a determining vote on all questions that concerned them or anybody else. We were democratic in those days, and I am afraid freedom broadened slowly down from president to president. We were loyal, law-abiding citizens under their rule, but when our president was sitting at the top of the area steps, taking the air after his morning's work, it used to be no shock to me to see him tickled on the top of his head by people like tradesmen coming for orders, or a policeman, or a nursery maid. The president, in these circumstances, would arch a back, make poker of a tail, and purr. Being at leisure and unoccupied with cares of state, he did not pretend to be anything but bourgeois. The bourgeoisie had access to him. He would play with them, without any sense of inequality, through the area railings. There was a nursery maid, I remember, whom our last president was very much attached to. He used to make the most terrific onslaughts at her shoelaces. But now all that regime is past. We are royalist again to the core, and Cyrus, of undoubtedly royal descent, is on the throne. The revolution was accomplished in the most pacific manner conceivable. A friend, on my birthday two years ago, brought a small wicker basket, and the moment it was opened, the country, which for a month or two had been in a state of darkest anarchy, without president or any ruler, was a civilized state again, with an acknowledged king. There was no war, nothing sanguinary occurred, only by virtue of the glory of our king we became a great power again. Cyrus had arranged that his pedigree should come with him. This was much bigger than Cyrus, and being written on parchment, with a large gold crown painted at the head of it, was far more robust than he whose ancestors it enumerated. For his majesty, as he peered over the side of the royal cradle, did not seem robust at all. He put two little weak paws on the edge of his basket, and tried to look like a lion, but he had no spirit to get farther. Then he wrinkled up his august face, and gave a sneeze so prodigious that he tumbled out of the basket altogether, and by accident, or at the most by catarrh, set foot in the dominions where he still reigns. Of course, I was not quite so stupid as not to recognize a royal landing, though made in so unconventional a manner. It was only as if George the Fourth, in one of his numerous landings on some pier, so fitly commemorated by the insertion of a large brass boot print, had fallen flat on his face instead, and was commemorated by a full-length brass, with top hat a little separate. Babies of the human species, it is true, are all like each other, and I would defy any professor of eugenics or of allied and abstruse schools of investigation to say, offhand, whether a particular baby, divorced from his surroundings, is the Prince of Wales or Master Jones. But quite apart from his pedigree there was never any question at all about Cyrus. There was no single hair on his lean little body that was not of the true and royal blue, and his ears already were tufted inside with downy growth, and his poor little eyes, sadly screened by the moisture of his guitar, showed their yellow topaz irises that were never seen on Master Jones. So he tumbled upside down into his new kingdom, and recovering himself, sat up and blinked, and said, <coughs> I took him up very reverently in both hands and put him on my knee. He made an awful face, like a Chinese grotesque instead of a Persian king, but anyhow it was an oriental face. Then he put a large paw in front of his diminutive nose and went fast asleep. It had been a most fatiguing sneeze. Royal Persian babies, as you perhaps know, must never, after they have said goodbye to their royal mamas, be given milk. When they are thirsty they must have water. When they are hungry they have little finely chopped up dishes of flesh and fish and fowl. As Cyrus slept, little chopped up things were hastily prepared for him, and when he woke his food and drink were waiting his royal pleasure. They seemed to please him a good deal, but at a crucial moment, when his mouth was quite full, he sneezed again. There was an explosion of awful violence, but the royal baby licked up the fragments. We knew at once that we had a tidy king to rule over us. Cyrus was two months old when he became king, and the next four months were spent in growing and eating and sneezing. His general manner of life was to eat largely and instantly fall asleep, and it was then, I think, that he grew. Eventually a sneeze plucked him from his slumber, and this first alarm was a storm cone, so to speak, that betokened the coming tornado. Once, after I began to count, he sneezed seventeen times. Then, when that was over, he sat quiet and recuperated. Then he jumped straight up in the air, 
purred loudly, and ate again. The meal was succeeded by more slumber, and the cycle of his day was complete. His first refreshment he took about seven in the morning, as soon as anybody was dressed, and an hour later, heavily slumbering, he was brought up to my room when I was called, buttoned up in my servant's coat, and placed on my bed. He at once guessed that there must be a pleasant warm cave underneath the bedclothes, and with stampings and purrings, penetrated into this abyss, curled himself against my side, and resumed his interrupted slumbers. After a while, I would feel an internal stirring begin in my bed, and usually manage to deposit the king on the floor before his first sneeze. His second breakfast, of course, had come upstairs with my hot water, and after the sneezing was over, he leaped into the air, espied and stalked some new and unfamiliar object, and did his duty with his victuals. He then looked round for a convenient resting place, choosing one, if possible, that resembled an ambush, the definition of which may be held to be a place with a small opening and spaciousness within. That gave us the second clue, tidiness being the first, towards the king's character. He had a tactical mind, and should make a good general. As soon as I observed this, I used to make an ambush for him among the sheets of the morning paper, providing it with a small spy-hole. If I scratched the paper in the vicinity of the spy-hole, a little silver-blue paw made wild dabs at the seat of the disturbance. Having thus frustrated any possible enemy, he went to sleep. But the ambush he liked best was a half-open drawer, such as he found one morning for himself. There among flannel shirts and vests he made himself exceedingly comfortable, pending attacks. But before he went to sleep, he made a point of putting out a small and awe-inspiring head to terrify any marauding bands who might be near. This precaution was usually successful, and he slept for the greater part of the morning. For six months he stuffed and sneezed and slept, and then one morning, like Lord Byron in the discovery of his fame, Cyrus woke and discovered the responsibilities of kingship. His sneezing fits suddenly ceased, and the Cyropidea, or education of Cyrus, began. He conducted his own education, of course, entirely by himself. He knew, by heredity, what a king had to learn, and proceeded to learn it. Hitherto, the pantry and my bedroom were the only territories of his dominion that he had any acquaintance with, and a royal progress was necessary. The dining-room did not long detain him, and presented few points of interest. But in a small room adjoining he found on the table a telephone, with a long green cord attached to the receiver. This had to be investigated, since his parents had not told him about telephones. But he soon grasped the principle of it, and attempted to get the earpiece off its hook no doubt with a view to issuing orders of some kind. It would not yield to gentle methods, and after crouching behind a book and wriggling his body a great deal, he determined to rush the silly thing. A wild leap in the air, and Cyrus and the green cord and the receiver were all mingled up together in hopeless confusion. He did not telephone again for weeks. The drawing-room was less dangerous. There was a bearskin on the floor, and Cyrus sat down in front of the head, prepared to receive homage. This, I suppose, was duly tendered, because he tapped it on the nose, as the king entering the city of London touches the sword presented by the Lord Mayor, and passed on to the piano. He did not care about the keyboard, but liked the pedals, and also caught sight of a reflection of himself in the black shining front of it. This was rather a shock, and entailed a few swift, fandango-like steps with forepaws waving wildly in the air. Horror! The silent image opposite did exactly the same thing, it was nearly as bad as the telephone. But the piano stood at an angle to the wall, offering a suitable ambush, and he scampered behind it. And there he found the great ambush of all, for the back cloth of the piano was torn, and he could get completely inside it. Tactically it was a perfect ambush, for it commanded the only route into the room from the door. But his delight in it was such that, whenever he was ambushed there, he could not resist putting his head out and glaring if anybody came near thus giving the secret completely away. Or was it only indulgence towards our weak intellects that were so incapable of imagining that there was a king inside the piano? The exploration of the kitchen followed. The only point of interest was a fox-terrier at whom the king spat. But in the scullery there was a very extraordinary affair, namely, a brass tap, conveniently placed over a sink, half covered with a board. On the nozzle of this tap, an occasional drop of water appeared, which at intervals fell off. Cyrus could not see what happened to it, but when next the drop gathered he put his paw to it and licked it off. 
After doing this for nearly an hour, he came to the conclusion that it was the same water as he drank after his meals. The supply seemed constant, though exiguous. It might have to be seen to. After that, he just looked in at the linen cupboard, and the door blew to while he was inside. He was not discovered till six hours later, and was inclined to be stiff about it. Next day the royal progress continued, and Cyrus discovered the garden, forty feet by twenty, but large enough for Mr. Lloyd George to have his eye on it, and demand a valuation of the mineral rights therein. But it was not large enough for Cyrus. I don't know what he expected, for after looking at it closely for a morning, he decided that he could run up the brick walls that bounded it. This was an infringement of his prerogative, for the king is bound to give notice to his ministers when he proposes to quit the country, and Cyrus had said nothing about it. Consequently, I ran out and pulled him quietly but firmly back by the tail, which was the only part of him that I could reach. He signified his disapproval in what is called the usual manner, and tried to bite me. Upon which I revolted, and drove the king indoors and bought some rabbit wire. This I fastened down along the top of the wall, so that it projected horizontally inwards. Then I let the king out again and sat down on the steps to see what would happen. Cyrus pretended that the walls were of no interest to him, and stalked a few dead leaves. But even a king is bounded, not only by rabbit wire, but by the limitations of cat nature, which compel him to attempt again what he has been thwarted over. So, after massacring a few leaves, already dead, he sprang up the wall, and naturally hid his nose against the rabbit wire, and was cast back from the frontier into his own dominions. Once again he tried and failed, appealed to an obdurate prime minister, and then sat down and devoted the whole power of his tactical mind to solving this baffling affair. And three days afterwards I saw him again run up the wall, and instead of hitting his nose against the rabbit wire, he clung to it with his claws. It bent with his weight, and he got one claw on the upper side of it, then the other, wriggled round it, and stood triumphant with switching tail on the frontier. So in turn I had to sit and think. But short of building up the whole garden wall to an unscalable height, or erecting a chevaux de frise on the top of it, I had a barren brain. After all, foreign travel is an ineradicable instinct in cat nature, and I infinitely preferred that the king should travel among small back gardens than out of the area gate into the street. Perhaps, if he had full license, especially since I could not prevent him, to explore the hinterlands, he might leave the more dangerous coast alone. And then I thought of a plan, which perhaps might recall my Ries Kaiser when on his travels. This I instantly proceeded to test. Now I had been told by my cabinet that the one noise which would pluck the king out of his deepest slumber, and would bring him bouncing and ecstatic to the place where this sound came from, was the use of the knife sharpener. This, it appeared, was the earliest piece of household ritual performed in the morning, when Cyrus was hungriest, and the sound of the knife sharpener implied to him imminent food. I borrowed the knife sharpener and ran out into the garden. Cyrus was already four garden walls away, and paid not the slightest attention to my calling him. So I vigorously began stropping the knife. The effect was instantaneous. He turned and fled along the walls that separated him from that beloved and welcome noise. He jumped down into his own dominion with erect and bushy tail, and I gave him three little oily fragments of sardine skin. And, up till now at any rate, that metallic chirruping of the sharpened knife has never failed. Often I have seen him a mere speck on some horizon roof, but there appears to be no incident or interest in the whole range of foreign travel that can compete with this herald of food. On the other hand, too, if Cyrus is not quite well, this very seldom happens, Though he does not care for food, he does not either feel up to foreign travel, and therefore the knife sharpener may repose in its drawer. Indeed, there are advantages in having a greedy king that I had never suspected. As the months went on, and Cyrus grew larger and longer-haired, he gradually, as befitted a king who had come to rule over men, renounced all connection with other animals, especially cats. He used to lie perdu in a large flower-pot which he had overturned, ejecting the hydrangea with scuffles of backward-kicking hind legs, and watch for the appearance of his discarded race. If so much as an ear or a tail appeared on the frontier walls, he hurled himself, his face a mask of fury, at the intruder. The same ambush, I am sorry to say, served him as a butt for the destruction of sparrows. He did not kill them, but brought them indoors to the kitchen, and presented them, 
as a token of his prowess as a hunter, to the cook. Dogs, similarly, were not allowed, when he sat at the area gate. Once I saw, returning home from a few doors off, a brisk Irish terrier gamble down my area steps, Cyrus's area steps, I mean, and quickened my pace, fearing for Cyrus if he happened to be sitting there. He was sitting there, but I need not have been afraid, for before I had reached the house a prolonged and dismal yell rent the air, and an astonished Irish terrier shot up, as from a gun, through the area gate again with a wild and hunted expression. When I got there, I found Cyrus, seated on the top step, calm and firm, delicately licking the end of his silvery paw. Once only, as far as I remember, was Cyrus ever routed by anything with four legs, but that was not a question of lack of physical courage, but a collapse of nerves in the presence of a sort of hobgoblin, something altogether uncanny and elfin. For a visitor had brought inside her muff an atrocious little griffin, and Cyrus had leaped onto this lady's knee and rather liked the muff. Then, from inside it, within an inch or two of Cyrus's face, there looked out a half-fledged little head of a new and nerve-shattering type. Cyrus stared for one moment at this dreadful apparition, and then bolted inside the piano ambush. The griffin thought this was the first maneuver in a game of play, so jumped down and sniffed round the entrance to the ambush. Panic-stricken scufflings and movements came from within. Then a diabolical thought struck me. Cyrus had never yet been in his ambush when the piano was played, and the griffin being stowed back again in the muff, for fear of accidents, I went very softly to the keys and played one loud chord. As the Irish terrier came out of the area gate, so came Cyrus out of his violated sanctuary. Cyrus was now just a year old. His kitten coat had been altogether discarded. He already weighed eleven pounds, and he was clad from nose to tail tip in his complete royal robes. His head was small, and looked even smaller framed in the magnificent ruff that curled outwards from below his chin. In color he was like a smoky shadow, with two great topaz lights gleaming in the van. The tips of his paws were silvery, as if wood ash smoldered whitely through the smoke. That year we enjoyed a summer of extraordinary heat, and Cyrus made the unique discovery about the refrigerator, a large tin box like a safe that stood in the scullery. The germ of the discovery, I am afraid, was a fluke, for he had snatched a steak of salmon from the tray which the fishmonger had most imprudently left on the area steps, and with an instinct for secrecy which this unusual treasure trove awoke in him, he bore it to the nearest dark place, which happened to be the refrigerator. Here he ate as much as it was wise to gobble at one sitting, and then, I must suppose, instead of going to sleep, he pondered. For days he had suffered from the excessive heat. His flower-pot ambush in the garden was unendurable. So also was his retreat under my bedclothes. But here was a far more agreeable temperature. This is all the reconstruction of motive that I can give, and it is but guesswork. But day after day, while the heat lasted, Cyrus sat opposite the refrigerator and bolted into it whenever he found opportunity. The heat also increased his somnolence, and one morning, when he came up to breakfast with me, he fell asleep on the sofa before I had time to cut off the little offering of kidney which I had meant to be my homage. When I put it quite close to his nose, he opened his mouth to receive it, but was again drowned in gulfs of sleep before he could masticate it, so it stuck out of the corner of his mouth like a cigarette. But eventually, I knew, he would wake and remember and understand. And now Cyrus is two years old, and has reigned a year and ten months. I think he has completed his own education, and certainly he has cleared his frontiers of cats, and, I am afraid, his dominion of sparrows. One misguided bird this year built in a small bush in his garden. A series of distressing, unfledged objects were presented to the cook. He has appropriated the chair I was accustomed to use in my sitting-room, and he has torn open the new backcloth that I had caused to be put on my piano. I dare say he was right about that, for there is no use in having an ambush if you cannot get into it. In other ways, too, I do not think he is strictly constitutional. But whenever I return to his kingdom after some absence, as soon as the door is open, Cyrus runs down the steps to meet me, even as Puscat used to do, and makes a poker of his tail and says, that makes up for a good deal of what appears to be tyranny. And only this morning he gave me a large spider, precious and wonderful, and still faintly stirring. End of section 13
Section 14 of The Countess of Loundis Square and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Noble, RomanNoble.com. The Countess of Loundis Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Crank Stories, Chapter 1 The Tragedy of Oliver Bowman. Oliver Bowman was sitting opposite his sister after dinner, watching her cracking walnuts in her strong, firm hands. The wonder of it never failed. She put two walnuts in her palms, pressed her hands together as if in silent prayer, and then there was a great crash and pieces of walnut shell flew about the table. It was a waste of energy, no doubt, since close behind her were the nutcrackers that gave the nut eater so great a mechanical advantage. But then his sister had so much energy that it would have been not less ridiculous to accuse the sea of wasting energy because it broke in waves on the shore. Presently she would drink a couple of glasses of port and begin smoking in earnest. And then, asked Oliver, who was exhibiting a fraternal interest in the way in which Alice had passed her day, then I had tea at an ABC shop and walked around the park. Lovely day. You ought to have come out. I had a little headache, said Oliver. He spoke in a soft voice, which occasionally cracked and went into a high key, as when a boy's voice is breaking. That had happened to him some fifteen years ago, since he was now thirty, but he had made a habit of dropping into falsetto tones as being an engaging remnant of youthfulness. A good walk in the sun and wind would have made that better, said his sister. But I don't like the sun, he said petulantly, and you know I detest the wind. What did you do then? she asked. I read a story by Conrad about a storm at sea. I quite felt as if I was going through it all without any of the inconveniences of it. That is the joy of a well-written book. It enlarges your experiences without paying you out for them. Alice dusted the fragments of walnut shell from her fingers, poured out a glass of port, and lit a cigarette. I would sooner do any one thing myself than read about any twenty, she observed. I should hate to get my experiences second-hand, already digested for me, just as I should hate to wear second-hand clothes or eat peptimized food. They got to be mine, and I've got to do them. I mean, digest them, myself. Oliver refused port and took a very little coffee with a good deal of hot milk in it. Considering nature has been making men and women for so many million years, it's odd how often she makes mistakes about them, he said. He constantly puts them into the wrong envelope. She puts a baby girl into a baby boy's envelope and a baby boy into a baby girl's. You ought to have been a boy, Alice, and I ought to have been a girl. Alice could not resist another walnut or two, and the crashings began again. That may be true, she said, but that's not really the point. A woman may be a real woman and yet want to do things herself. The real mistake that nature makes is to give people arms and legs in quantity of good red blood and not give them the desire of using them. Or to give them an imagination without the desire of using it, remarked Oliver. Well, I'm glad I have none, said Alice firmly. I never imagine what a thing is going to be like. I go and do the thing, and then I know. They passed into the drawing room next door, which seemed to bear out Oliver's criticism on nature's mistakes, because the room had been furnished and decorated in accordance with his taste, and with one exception was completely a woman's room. Everything in it was soft and shaded and screened sideways and draped, but in one corner was a turning lathe with an unshaded electric light directly over it. Oliver walked across to an easy chair by the fireplace and took down an embroidered bag that hung on a painted screen there. It contained a quantity of colored wools and an embroidery tambour. He was employed just now on making a chair back in Petite Point and could easily fill in areas of uniform color by electric light, though daylight was necessary for matching shades of wool. The design was a perfect, unreal, rustic scene with a cottage and tree and a lamb and a blue sky and a slightly lighter blue lake. It realized completely to him what the country ought to be like, and what the country never was like. Instead of the lamb, there was in real life barking dog and a wasp. Instead of a clean white cottage, a pigsty or a cowshed, where stupid animals breathed heavily through their noses at you. Oliver hated the country in consequence, and never left town unless it was to immure himself from Saturday till Monday, in a very comfortable house with central heating, or to spend a few weeks in some other town. But it was delightful to sit in his own pleasant room and with colored wools make a picture of what the country should be. In the foreground of his piece were clumps of daffodils, which he copied from those that stood on a table near him, for there ought always to be daffodils in the foreground. Alice occupied herself for half an hour or so with an active foot on the treadle of her lathe. 
and made loud buzzing noises with steel tools and boxwood then as usual she went to bed very early after a short struggle to read the evening paper and left oliver to himself these were the hours which he liked best of all the day for there was no chance of being interrupted and no prospect of having to go out of doors or perform any action in which he would come in contact with real life in any form alice's lathe was silent and all around him were soft shaded objects and his piece of needlework but though he disliked the rough touch of life more than anything in the world there was nothing he liked better than to imagine himself in the hubbub and excitement of adventure without stirring from his chair sometimes as he had done this afternoon he would read a story of the sea and thus without terror of shipwreck or qualm of nausea listen to the crash of menacing waves and the throb of the racing screw sometimes he would spend an hour in the country while his unerring needle made daffodils or lambs or with the strong effort of the imagination travel across france to the delightful shores of the riviera with a vividness derived from the continental bradshaw a sniff at the lemon brought in with a tray of wafer biscuits and a siphon could give him the effect of a saunter through the lemon grove outside nice and the jingle of money in his pocket recalled the casino at monte carlo where he saw himself amassing a colossal fortune in a single night and losing it all again as a matter of fact he never set foot in the real temple of chance because there were so many bald females there who looked at his handsome face with such friendly if not provocative glances for though in imagination he was a perfect don juan the merest glance of interest from a female eye would send him scurrying back like a lost lamb to the protective austerity of alice to-night it seemed to him that the habits and instincts of years came about him in crowds asking him to classify them and construct a definite theory about them for use in practical life and suddenly in a flash of illumination he saw the coherence principle on which he had acted so long without consciously formulating it he had always hated real people real experiences the sun the wind the rain but equally had he loved the counterfeits of them as presented by art in its various forms and by the suggestions that a lemon or a continental bradshaw or a piece of woolwork could give him the theory that held all these things together was that life for him consisted of imagination not of experience and the practical application of that was to study and soak himself in the suggestions that gave him the sting of experience without any sordid contact with life to make a fortune or lose one at monte carlo would have implied setting cheek to jaw with bold bad people and risking a great deal of money it was infinitely better to study the timetable of the trains to monte carlo sniff a lemon and jingle his money in his pocket while if he wanted the sense of the hot smoke-laden scent-heavy atmosphere he must smoke a cigarette and sprinkle his handkerchief with mask of fragrant pine a pack of cards thrown about the table would assist the illusion and he could say fais vos jours messieurs et mesdames in the chanting monotone of the croupiers from that night his horizons began to expand and he wondered at himself for the blindness in which he had hitherto spent his life the london streets in spite of the wind and the sun and the rain and the fog woke into a teeming life of their own and pelted suggestions at him as the crowd pelted confetti at me carême he began not to dislike the crowded pavements for he no longer took any notice of the real people who were there so absorbing what had become the shop windows which gave him the material which he translated into dreams hitherto when he had passed a fish shop he had held his breath so that the objectionable smell of it might not vex him and now he inhaled it with a gusto as adding to the vividness of m pierre lat perche de hollande he would stand before a fish shop for five minutes at a time and be no longer in bond street but in the hold of his boat or on the quay at pompole even the boy in the shop who went out with a flat tray on his shoulder was mon frere eyes and oliver almost spoke to him in french next door was a shop filled with japanese screens and carved jade and branches of paper cherry blossom and lo his fishing experiences were whisked away and he was living in the land of madame chrysanthemum but it was only for a short while that the shop windows were so to speak colored illustrations in books written by other men for he soon discarded these second-hand canvases and constructed out of them and the wealth of suggestive material that lay broadcast round him new and amazing adventures of his own his senses and in particular his sense of smell grew every day more acute for daily he was keenly on the lookout for a sight or sound touch or smell that would be to him a hint out of which he could evolve some fantastic imagination that lived henceforth in his brain as the memory of an actual experience lives in the brain of those who like his sister must know that a thing has happened to them before they can call it their own but of all the senses that of smell supplied him with the vividest hints the aromatic ordure 
for instance that came out of the door of a chemist's shop would launch him on a brain adventure which lasted the whole length of a stroll down piccadilly in which he found himself suffering from some acute and mysterious disease that baffled the skills of doctors and led them to administer all manner of curious drugs in the hope of bringing him alleviation then when he had soaked the honey from his painful experience for however disagreeable such an illusion would have been in real life it had in those vivid unrealities the thrill and excitement of such without any of its inconveniences the sight of a jeweller's window blazing with gems would scatter the clouds of his approaching demise and muffle the sound of his own passing bell with the strains of a ballroom band he would spring from his deathbed experiencing a new incarnation and a change of sex would be the central figure queen in her own right of some great state ball she he that is to say was unmarried and as she wove the chain of the royal quadrille the hands of a half a dozen aspirants to be her prince consort communicated their hopes in the pressure of fingertips a tiara to which the one in the shop window supplied the clue was on her golden-haired head ropes of pearls clinged as she moved a great diamond four times the size of the solitary splendor that winked on the dark blue velvet there scintillated on her breast and to each of her lovers the grand duke peter the archduke francis the prince ignatius she gave the same mysterious little smile that while she disdained their passion yet expressed some faint vibrating response all men seemed rather alike to her and she gave a little sigh half contemptuous of their adoration half curious about the desire that made them so divinely discontent to-night she had determined to choose one of them for queen though she was she must conform to the usage of the world and besides besides the thought of bearing a child of her own made some secret nerve ecstatically ache within her she must choose then even while oliver was hesitating between the archduke francis and prince ignatius he would catch sight of a flower seller by the fountain in piccadilly circus and straightway he would be in the country of his petite point again where lambs were white and lakes blue or the sight of a draped model with a waxwork head would switch him off into an amorous adventure with a lady in an orange-coloured dress just like that and the point of an infinitesimal shoe peeping seductively from below them by degrees this particular figure standing in royal state alone behind the plate glass window in regent street began to exercise a controlling influence on his imagination and he would hurry by the rows of shops which lay on his route without constructing independent romances out of the hints they gave him and only glancing at them to see what suggestions they supplied as regards her he gave her for instance the tiara which he had worn when he was queen in his own right he presented her with some lemon-coloured gloves that reached to her elbows he bought her daffodils from the piccadilly circus and rather more tentatively he endowed her with a black hat with gloire de jaune roses in it and standing there in front of her he would hold up to his nose the handkerchief on which he had poured wallflower scent which he was sure she would use and inhale a sweetness that really seemed to come from her through the plate glass window all other shops which could not contribute to her embellishment became uninteresting again and once more he would hurry with held breath past the fishmonger for it was clearly unsuitable to present her with kippers raw salmon or even live lobsters then standing a little sideways not directly in front of her her eyes met his and though usually they seemed lost in reverie occasionally they would meet his own in a way that sent his heart thumping in his throat always she wore the same faint unfathomable smile reminding him of leonardo's mona lisa and it seemed to him that the reason for which nature had brought him into the world was that he should penetrate into the thoughts that set that red mouth so deliciously ajar it must surely be on his own lips that it would close her loveliness while she was kind made the whole world lovely to him and his whole nature seemed to awake his constant day-long walks about london has wonderfully improved his health he no longer feared the sun and the wind and got quite bronzed complexion still more remarkable was so to speak the psychical bronzing of his mind the sun-tanned of virility that overspread it everything was shot with interest for him and he even got alice to show him how to work the lathe for this was no pining and lovelorn affection it was quite a hopeful affair and though when alone he might sign and turn over and back again on his bed the brilliance and upright carriage of the object of his adoration stung him into a manly robustness she would not like him to go sighing and sheltering himself about the world it was no wonder that alice noticed and applauded the change in him something has happened to you oliver she said one night at dinner 
while they were cracking walnuts together for he had aspired to that accomplishment though it hurt his soft hands very much something has happened to you i wonder if i can guess what it is he felt quite secure of the secrecy of his passion and cracked two walnuts i'm quite certain you can't he said lord that did hurt well i shall do no harm then if i try she said i believe you've fallen in love the convoluted kernels dropped from oliver's fingers what makes you think that he asked my dear it's obvious to a woman's eyes always told you that what you needed was to fall in love you don't do wool work any more you walk instead of sitting in an easy chair some day if you go on like this you will play golf gracious am i as bad as that he exclaimed startled into an irony that gave his case away alice clapped her hands delightedly ah i am right then she cried my dear do tell me who she is shall i go and call on her have i ever seen her oliver felt a curious diplomatic pleasure in giving true information which he knew would deceive yes i feel sure you have seen her he said remembering that alice had her dresses made at the shop where his divinity deified the window i can't say that you know her oh who is she cried alice is she a girl is she a woman will she marry you no i don't suppose so he said alice's face fell is she somebody else's wife then she asked i hope not but i don't know that it matters it is the fact of your having fallen in love which has improved you so immensely i've noticed that an unhappy romance is just as good for people as a humdrum success which ends in christening mugs and perambulators oliver got up you are rather coarse sometimes dear alice he observed oliver's romance and his growing robustness lasted for some few days after alice had guessed his secret and then an end came to it more horribly than any that his wildest imaginations could have suggested to him one day he had seen in a celebrated furrier's a sable stole that would most delightfully protect his lady's waxen neck from the inclemencies of a shrewd may morning and he hurried along while that was still vivid to his eye in order to visualize it around her neck there was a crowd of women in front of her window and he edged his way in with eyes downcast as was his wont so that she might burst splendidly upon him in a short range then full of devotion and sable stole he raised them she was not there and her place was a bold-faced creature in carmine with lustful wicked eyes like the females at monte carlo his healthy outdoor life stood him in good stead at the moment for he did not swoon or address shrill ejaculations to his maker he just staggered back one step as if he had received a blow in the chest then rallied his failing forces again all day he walked from dressmaker to dressmaker seeking to find her and when he was too much fatigued to pursue his way on foot any longer he went to his club and by the aid of a london directory ascertained the addresses of a couple of dozen more shops further afield where she might possibly be found these he visited in a taxi but without success and returned home to his flat a quarter of an hour before dinner where utterly exhausted he went to sleep in his chair naturally he dreamed about her in a vague nightmarish manner and she seemed to be in trouble he awoke with a start and for a moment thought like pygmalion he had brought his galatea to life for there she stood in front of him in the dusk at least her orange dress stood there my dear oliver said alice's voice aren't you ready for dinner yet make me some compliment on my new tea-gown after that miserable adventure he resolved to have no more to do with the serious or emotional side of life and the words of one of our modern bards he held it best in living to take all things very lightly he had consecrated all the power of his imagination on one great passion and now his dream was exploded and alice had got the tea-gown almost worse than that was the divine orange vesture of his beloved had begun to multiply in a most unseemly manner in the shops of quite inferior dressmakers and half a dozen times a day he could feel his breath catch in his throat as for a moment he thought he saw in some other window the wraith of her who was forever lost to him but while this stung and wounded him it yet probably helped to cure him and a few weeks later he was immersed again in the minor joys of life visiting capri in the bay of naples when he saw the cage of quails in the poulterers shops going again to court balls opposite the jewellers tossing with the fishing fleet on moonlit nights off the cornish coast opposite the fishmongers or spending hours in the country over his embroidery frame one day a smart shower drove him into the portals of micklewaite stores in knightsbridge 
where the most exotic of purchasers can find their curious wants supplied and all at once it struck him that these incessant peregrinations of the streets made up a very diluted form of life here all possible fountains of desire and adventure scintillated under one roof and you had but to take a step out of the arctic winter of the fur department to find yourself in the hot summer weather of straw hats or playing a match against the heads of the profession in the room where billards balls and tables were sold though he would never fall seriously in love again he could have some pleasant flirtations in the ladies underwear department or if his mood was byronic he would go to the games department and think of the nursery he would have furnished for his growing family if the beloved in the orange dress had remained faithful to him and not given her tea-gown to alice whom it strangely misbecame with a stifled groan he would tear himself away from that and surrounded by paper and envelopes and red tape and sealing wax spend an hour as secretary of state for foreign affairs conducting obtruse diplomatic operations with the perfidious turk and worsting him at every turn in the tangled game so underneath those lofty roofs and terracotta cupolas he began to live a life of which the variety of extravagance baffles description a chance shower had originally taken him there for on such small accidents does our destiny it depend but no rain or fine hot or cold he was the first in the morning to pass through the swinging doors and with a couple of hurried intervals for meals the last to leave in the evening whether august burned the torrid pavements outside or whether the fog gripped the town in its grimy hand there was always the same warm calm atmosphere inside laden with a hundred aromatic scents and teeming with rich suggestions of love and athletics and chemistry and travel often in the morning he would be tempted to go straight to the department of tea gowns and other more intimate feminine apparel but he kept a firm hold on himself and transacted business in the stationery department or spent a studious hour in the book room first nor did he neglect his exercise and in the game department he knocked up a hundred runs at cricket or had a brisk game of hockey or played a round of golf a pursuit to which he was now passionately attached owing to the strange suggestive forms of niblicks and brasses or artistically inclined he would wander among paint boxes palettes and sketching umbrellas by the shore of some windless sea and then hurry away to a counter behind which were discreet bathing costumes for both sexes and spend a pleasant quarter of an hour in mixed bathing this always gave him an appetite and he tripped off to the cooked foods department popping in at the bakery on the way and had a delicious lunch off crisp country bread with a pot of caviar and a couple of slices of galantine washed down with a glass of chablis from the wine department then perhaps after a whiff of roasting coffee from the grocery department he would put on some clean ducks with a gray silk tie haberdashery in which he put a pear-shaped pearl pin jewelry and then fresh and cool spent half an hour of airy bandage with the agreeable ladies whose presence as he recollected mr patter saying so strangely rose beside the chiffon and millinery his constant passage through the various departments provoked no suspicion in the minds of the shop-walkers and attendants that he was one of the light-fingered brigade for from time to time he made small purchases and always paid ready cash and it occurred to no one that here was an opportunity of studying firsthand the rapid development of one of the strangest and most harmless monomaniacs who had ever pursued his innocent way outside the protective walls of a lunatic asylum after such a delicious lunch it was no wonder that when he went back to his flat he could make but small pretense at eating for in imagination he had fared so delicately and well that the lumps of muscular mutton and robust beef provided by alice's catering made no appeal to him she might wonder at the smallness of his appetite but she couldn't feel the slightest anxiety about it so bright of eye and alert of limb was he under the spell of the happy busy life crowded with incident that now was his after lunch he would sit with her a little talking in the most vivid and interesting manner on the topics of the moment and then looking at his watch would silently remind himself that he was giving a pinaforte recital at three if he was already a little late would call a taxi to take him back to the stores while he supplied and gave massage to his fingers as he drove he was by this time in an advanced state of disagreeable insanity 
for he had lost all control over his imagination the workings of which were entirely in the hands of the suggestions that external objects made to it it was just in this that the completeness of his enjoyment of life lay it was in this too that there lay such discomfort and suffering as was his the sight of a dental case in a window with its rows of gleaming teeth and rose-coloured gums and palate was sufficient to give him a violent stab of pain in his teeth for the suggestion implied that he would have to get them all taken out before he attained the acquisition of those foreign splendours but he had learned by this time the position of all the shops between his flat and the stores which displayed these in similar dolorous exhibitions and his eyes would instinctively avert itself from doctors door plates or shops where were sold ear trumpets and pitch with the precision of a bird on a twig on cheerful and harmonious windows he no longer in fact lived a self-governing life of his own but was no more than thistle-down in a wind before the suggestions that the outside world made to his disordered senses and then as was bound to happen sooner or later came the crash that day he saw for the first time close behind the lift in the boot department through which he passed by accident for boots conveyed nothing at all to him a black door slightly ajar and thinking with the pang of delight that some fresh world of experiences might be about to burst upon him he entered his first impression was of some lovely garden full of white flowers arranged in wreaths as if in garden beds and all covered with glass cases then he saw that though his first impression had been of gleaming whites the predominant note was black there were black cloaks black scarves black hats black edged cards and then with a sudden icy pang in his heart he saw straight in front of him a large oblong box with glass sides on the top of which were nodding ostrich plumes simultaneously there advanced out of the gloom a small man in black clothes with neat side whiskers clearly dyed he came towards him rubbing his hands in a professional and sympathetic manner is there anything we can do for you sir he asked oliver's teeth chattered in his head and his eyes rolled heavensward then he spun around and fell in a heap on the floor. He was dead. End of section 14